I must press on. You may want to come back to me at the end. I must do this other psalm, Psalm 72. If I trust you know, not everybody does, that in a lot of the psalms, there is actually a Hebrew title which is part of the biblical text. Sometimes it gets buried with a um, edit in your Bibles with an addition, but if you've got it marked out, there's often a beginning. And the beginning of the psalm varies. It sometimes says it's a psalm of Solomon or a prayer of Solomon. Yeah. Other, other times it says a psalm, a, a psalm or a prayer for, um, for Solomon. And actually the Hebrew simply says of Solomon. Yeah. But when I put the list up at the beginning, I said it was written by David. Why did yeah. I say that? Well, the very last verse says the prayers of David, the son of Jesse, are ended. Yeah. So it appears to be a prayer of David from in the text. So why is it of or for Solomon? Well, it's another one of those passages where it's not clear if the subject is Solomon or the future Messiah. If you remember when we looked at God's conversation with David in 1 Kings and God's conversation with Solomon in 2 Kings, um, it wasn't quite clear if it's about Solomon or if it's about the Messiah. And here too we have this blend. Some bits feel more like Solomon, but an awful lot of it feels really, well, this is about Jesus. And the so, thought, so is, is it really a blend of both? It appears to be a blend of both, Catherine, yeah. Um, it's thought that David wrote it to be sung at Solomon's coronation. And it was his last, because of the ending, it was his last piece, his last work that he did. And he wanted Solomon to have proper respect. And in a way... Some people think that what began in um, where I began with chapter with Psalm 2 was also David saying to the people, make sure you treat Solomon right. Don't rebel against him. And it's very much coming from David's heart and it's his heart for his son. But it goes beyond that. And some of the terms in it go well beyond it. Because Solomon didn't live up to what David was praying for. So let's have a look at it. It's this blend. And I hope you get the blend as we go through. As I say, the word kingdom isn't here. But there's plenty about the king who has kingship. Give the king your judgments, O God. And your righteousness to the king's son. He will judge your people with righteousness. And you're poor with justice. The mountains will bring peace to the people and the little hills by righteousness. He will bring justice to the poor of the people. He will save the children of the needy and will break in pieces the oppressor. They shall fear you as long as the sun and moon endure throughout all generations. He shall come down like the rain upon the grass before mowing, like showers that water the earth. In his day the righteous shall flourish and abundance of peace until the moon is no more. He shall have dominion also from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. Those who doubt dwell in the wilderness will bow before him. And his enemies will lick the dust. The kings of Tarshish and of the Isles will bring presents. The kings of Sheba and Seba will offer gifts. Gifts. Yes, all kings shall fall down before him. All nations shall serve him. For he will deliver the needy when he cries. The poor also and him who has no helper. He will spare the poor and needy and will save the souls of the needy. He will redeem their life from oppression. 
and violence, violence, and the precious one shall be their blood, and precious shall be their blood in his sight, and he shall live, and the gold of Sheba will be given to him. Prayer also will be made for him continually, and daily he shall be praised. There will be an abundance of grain in the earth, on the top of the mountains, its fruit shall wave like Lebanon, and those of the city shall flourish like the grass of the earth. His name shall endure forever. His name shall continue as long as the sun, and men shall be blessed in him. All nations shall call him blessed. Blessed be the Lord God, the God of Israel, who only does wondrous things. And blessed be his glorious name forever. Let the whole earth be filled with his glory. Amen and amen. The prayers of David, the son of Jesse, are ended. We'll just pause. Just go back through some of those verses. Obviously, some are about Solomon. When it talks about ruling from the river, well, from sea to sea, people say that's the Mediterranean and to where Solomon's kingdom extended. And it probably was. But from the river to the ends of the earth, Solomon got nowhere there. But Jesus will. So this, to me, other things is righteousness. They'll be plentiful. Yes, Solomon's reign was good, but so much more. So again, it's one of these dual things where if you're looking back to Solomon, you can see him in there, but it leaves you some puzzlement because Solomon fell short of much that's in that psalm. But Jesus hasn't. And Jesus won't. And so this is the good things we've got here in this, that Things to be looking forward to when Jesus comes back. The character of his reign on earth. So, my question. Are you looking forward to the revealing of the kingship of heaven when our saviour king returns? Or, were you sold, have you embraced a gospel which has focused your hopes on escaping hell and going to heaven. I, I'm saying this because I believe that over history, Christians have missed out this glorious promise of the kingdom. We've reduced it to something else. And we are not looking forward to Jesus reigning on this earth. But revelation is quite clear. So the prophets that we'll look at, people will beat their swords into plowshares when the Messiah comes back. Do we only have a hope of escaping hell and being in heaven? Or do we actually have a hope of reigning on earth, being kings and priests with our God on earth when he comes back? I think I have to say that having been a Christian for many years, what happens when Jesus returns is not often talked about. It's not studied in its full context. And looking at his kingdom, his kingship, should help us to do that. And that's what I'm encouraging you to do, is to look forward to his return. So that's me finished. And it's time now for you to um, come with some questions and such like and talk and roast the preacher. I'd rather you roast the preacher now than um, when we, than afterwards. So it's time to um, talk about whatever I've, I've spurred in your minds and so on. 
Who well, wants to be I think it's phenomenal when you when you read those psalms. I mean, it's obviously going to be wonderful praising the Lord like that. I think one of our problems is knowing quite what it will look like when everything's righteous. It's it's mm. just so out of our imagination, isn't it? When we look round at what's going on. Yeah. It really is. Yeah. We can't imagine it. No, no. And don't get me on to the new heaven and new earth, because I can't imagine that either, Lucille. I, I, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I think the nearest I can get, and I, you might think this is a bit strange and possibly slightly irrelevant, irreverent, and if you're not a monarchist, you might get cross. But I think when you see the Queen come out onto that balcony, the whole of the Mall is full of people, all there, because they actually love her. If they don't love her, they at least like her and they're enthusiastic about her. And it's going to be that um, squared many times, isn't it? <laughs> Yeah, I, yeah. It, it, it's a picture to help us get hold of it. Yeah. It's quite yeah. a useful one. Yeah. Yeah. But it's it's something to stir the imagination, I think. Well, well, what that's what, like? Yeah, that's what I hope I've done. So yes. carry on. Well, you have, yes. I'm not going to roast the preacher. You have done that. <laughs> <laughs> you made me think from another angle. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, very much. Thank you. I like doing that, Lucille. Some years ago, in a in a real in-house by in in somebody's front room in a Bible study. Do you remember times like that? <laughs> yes. <laughs> you had to go to somebody's house to look at through the Bible. Absolutely. Um, we, we were fairly new involved with this group of people, and one of the guys looked at me across the room and said, "And what's your ministry?" And I thought, how do I answer this, Lord, quick? <laughs> and I came back and I looked at him and I said, provoking people to think by teaching them the Bible. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. If, I'm, if I'm provoking you to think, yeah. <laughs> I'm happy. Because <laughs> yes. um, yes. I've been to, through, sat through many too many sermons where I haven't been provoked to exactly. think. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Somebody else? Anybody else? Lucille can have another. Mary wants to come in. I know you can't see me, but I'm sure you can hear me. Um, <laughs> just what Randall was saying about King Solomon, it brought back to mind some things I'd reflected on when I read 1 Kings chapter 10 about the Queen of Sheba um, travelling to, she'd heard of Solomon and she came to test him with hard questions. And yeah. when I read it at the time, it made me think, that the two things going on here, there's her reaction to Solomon, but also some of the words were obviously foreshadowing what it would be like when Jesus reigns. So yeah. I'll just read a little bit. Um, yes. um, yeah. Solomon answered all her questions. There was nothing so difficult for the king that he could not explain it to her. Yes. And then it says um, she... she she, it says there was no more spirit in her when she'd seen all the all the various things in his palace. And she said to the king, it was a true report that I heard in my own land about your words and your wisdom. However, I did not believe the words until I came and saw with my own eyes. And indeed, the half was not told me. Your wisdom and prosperity exceeded the fame of which I heard. Happy are your men and happy are these your servants who stand continually before you and hear your wisdom. Blessed be the Lord your God who delighted in you, setting you on the throne of Israel. And it goes on. But it just made me think this is also about Christ in a, in a, a foreshadowing sort of way. And then in Matthew's gospel, it talks about um, one greater than Solomon. Yeah. You know, I hadn't thought about that phrase, one greater than Solomon, but it suddenly hit me. As Mary said it, it's just hit me. Matthew 12, verse 42. Matthew 12, 42, she says. He is. These psalms, these psalms and things about Solomon, he is greater. 
than Solomon in those contexts as well. You've got to remember in the end, he said it's all vanity. All that stuff that the Queen of Sheba was admiring would seem to be mainly worldly things and wealth and what have you, as well as his wisdom. But in the end, he said it's all vanity if, if he'd indeed been mm. like Ecclesiastes. And what did he say? Look to the ant. <laughs> For an example of industry and dedication. <laughs> uh, it's quite funny. The, I've always had a much broader view of the Bible because of my Jehovah's Witness training in inverted commas. <laughs> but even they had a very skewed vision of the coming kingdom. One of the JWs on Anglesey here said he was looking forward to the second coming because he, was, he, would, he would take over the golf course at Hollyhead. And to be able to play golf every day. <laughs> I mean, people have a very, you know, we, we're taught all along that we're, we're to look to heaven. But as you say, the, the psalmist said, the meek will inherit the earth. Yes. Whether that's a, in the millennium or a new heavens and a new earth is, is debatable. But it, it's, you know, as you say, they're ruling, we are supposed to rule as a kingdom of priests and kings here on the earth. And some say, that is happening now because that rule is to break and smash all the nations to pieces. So it certainly can't be in a new heavens and a new earth. And it looks to me, it sounds as if that's already happening now. You know, That's the kingdom now aspect of it, not the traditional kingdom now. But I'm sure you'll get to all that later, Randall. <laughs> you may do. <laughs> I turn to the Song of Songs chapter three, when Mary started comparing Solomon to Jesus. Yeah, carry on, Christine. Well, verse six says, who is this coming up from the wilderness yeah. like a column of smoke perfumed with myrrh and incense made from all the spices of the merchants? Look at his Solomon's courage. And so it goes on that he's got warriors with him. And then later on it says um, about his carriage, uh, verse 10, his seat was upholstered with purple, its interior inlaid with love. Daughters of Jerusalem, come out and look, you daughters of Zion, look on King Solomon wearing a crown, the crown with which his mother crowned him, on the day of his wedding, the day his heart rejoices. And I sort of feel there's echoes of Jesus in that. You know, the marriage supper of the lamb is the last bit. The bit about the wilderness and the myrrh and the incense. There's, you know, Jesus is everywhere, isn't he? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And he has, he has people with him. Um, perhaps it is us, the, the warriors, um, each of them wearing the sword, all experienced in battle, each with his sword at his side, prepared for the terrors of the night. Yeah. So Jesus comes to, to conquer yeah. as well, yeah. conquer evil yeah. by the breath of his mouth. Yeah. And of course, you've got lovely pictures of Jesus in, Revelation. Mm. I love the one when he comes with um, the sword in his mouth. Mm. We know that's li not literal, but that is um, the word. <laughs> yeah, that's the word of God mm. with which he will smite all his enemies. Mm. That's a lovely picture and a true prophecy of what will happen one day mm. when the king returns. Absolutely. And finally, he becomes the lamp in the holy city mm -hmm. because he's full of light. Mm -hmm. There's yep. no darkness left. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, that, the whole of Song of Solomon is often seen as, a, as the love relationship between yeah. Jesus and the church. Yeah. Or between Jesus and each one of us. Yeah. Yeah, it's a be it's a beautiful book. So Psalm 45 was a love song to the king, wasn't it? Yeah. 
But remember in the Song of Songs, the, the bride is the bride the bridegroom is reluctant. <laughs> like the the wise and foolish virgin. Yeah. That's the church. Asleep. Even the wise ones are asleep when he comes. Jesus said when he returns, will he find faith on the earth? Mm -hmm. Not a lot, as that man used to say. <laughs> yeah. But if, don't you think those psalms are wonderful? There's a sort of tonic to mm. for ourselves, aren't they? You mm. know, to to stir up our faith. Yeah. In the king and the, his kingdom early in the morning before we set out. They're lovely. Thank you, Randall. Can, can, can I just ask for a show of hands? How many of you have read the scriptures out loud when you're by yourself? Yeah. 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 I want to recommend it. You don't have to do it all the time, but particularly on some Psalms. Mm. But on yeah. other passages, by yourself, read them out loud. Declare them, not just to yourself, but out there, so that the principalities and powers can hear you. Um, I remember years ago doing that really helped me in a particular down bit. But it is, it's good to do it, to read the scriptures out loud. Yes, it's good to be reminded because I don't do it often enough. No, I don't think any of us do. <laughs> no, I don't do it often. So thank you for yes, giving the prod. <laughs> and Psalm 145, it's good to read it because that's one, I mean, here with the work I'm involved in. And yeah. It's really setting up the Christian school for supporting homeschool families when we can have them again. But my part is particularly the creation side. Yeah. Discovery Centre, and I felt very much Psalm 145 mm. is a sort of key one, I feel, to that, with one generation um, commending your works to another, and just yeah. to think of families coming together, looking at God's creation and his, mm. his work, understanding who he is. Mm. So it always excites me to read that one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Can I follow on that? Because something I found myself saying yesterday, through reading the Psalms, I'm, I'm convinced that God controls the weather. And someone in the group said, well, what about climate change and all that? But I am utterly convinced God controls the weather because he's the creator of the universe. Mm -hmm. I'm 100% with you there, and there's two ways to answer the question. One is, it's not climate change like it was in the days of Noah. That was climate change. <laughs> <laughs> and the other way is to say, well, maybe he's, we've messed up the, uh, the earth and he's doing it. And Isaiah 24 is a clear thing about how our sin, not our carbon emissions, has polluted the earth. Yeah. So have a read of that. Now, I think Wendy was raising her hand. Were well, you wanted to come in? You muted, Wendy, so. You're very right that when Christians get together, we tend to talk about all the things that are, have gone wrong. We don't really talk about the, king, you know, the glory of God and how wonderful our our Heavenly Father is, and I, I can see that we ought to, um, to do that more. Mm. It's harder to do that than to c complain about all the wrong things, when of course there are many of those. Yeah, and in Hebrews 10, 23, it says, when we come together, we yes. should stir up one another to love and good works. Yes. Those are positive things. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I'm, I'm glad I can be a catalyst in that way. Um, mm. And I hope you go out and in other Zoom conversations, take the opportunity to lift people up to him and not let them drag you down to all that's wrong. Yeah. 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 Ye
Mm. I'd love to have input on how we transmit this to young people and children. I think two quick things. Not the full answer, but two quick things. I think I would encourage you to pray for the younger generations, first of all. Mm. What I said earlier about the four horsemen of the apocalypse in mm. education, I do believe that God is angry at the way, not just in Britain, but around the world through organisations like UNESCO and UNICEF. They have got programs to teach global immorality to younger yeah. children. And yeah. I believe God wants us to pray for those younger generations. I think he has bought time for them with this pandemic. I think he said enough is enough. So we need to pray for them. And we need to pray that he would set their hearts seeking for him and then when believers are asked by them who is this God whom you believe that Christians will not give them religious answers but will speak from their experience of God and his goodness his righteousness his holiness and maybe even tell them, you know, God's rescued you by shutting down your schools. God's rescued you. He's given you an opportunity. Now, we'll have different callings to different age groups. But pray, even if you're not in a position where, you know, pray that God will raise up people who will share the glorious gospel of Jesus with them but pray first of all that their hearts will begin to seek for him yes I think I think it may not be next week I think we might have to have far more going on first but don't be frightened to say to them God stopped what was happening for your sake he loves you that much yeah um um, but do pray for them. They're big of a bit, several generation gaps away from some of us. But pray that God would raise up people who can speak his living word into their lives. And rescue it, because I have more faith, seriously, I have more faith to pray for the younger generations of today than I have for many in my generation. My, people in my generation have spent a lifetime saying no to God. And I'm not saying you can't set them free, but after a while, Pharaoh hardened his heart towards God, and then it changes. God started hardening Pharaoh's heart towards him. Yeah. And I fear that many in my generation, I'm not, you know, some will, but I, I'm praying that it will be from the younger generations. And I actually prayed in the last few days, Lord, you're doing this because you care for these children. You want them with you in eternity. Let's, you know, that's why he's, that's why he's given them breathing space. Let's pray to that end. Thank you. Thank you for asking the question, Christine. It yeah. touched something for me. Mm -hmm. but, but Randall, that we have they got breathing space. They're all going back to school quite soon, aren't they? And we'll be back to the to the real world again. You know, the yeah. world that we've been escaping from for a year. If you see what I mean. Um, that's what they said in the summer one day, and they were wrong. <laughs> I had a Jewish lady, I read her, I, I got an email a few days ago, but I reread it today, 
And this Jewish lady actually said to me, she's not a Christian, she, she's a Orthodox Jewish lady, but she said to me, um, they think they're going to open the schools, but God's got more um, mutations to come on this vaccine. Mm. And I can't say she's wrong. Mm. Right. And I think we have to pray. Um, Someday I, I watched a video by somebody who's a Christian, but she was talking about all the other things that are going on but right at the end of an extra little bit a bonus extra video she was talking about her christian faith and she mentioned what happened with gibeon and the midianites gideon and the midianites and she basically said you know gideon only had a little army but he didn't need a big one because god threw his enemies into confusion and they started fighting themselves. And I'd already been praying that way, that God would throw the, his enemies into confusion. And I'm very confident, whether we're talking about things like the Great Reset or vaccine um, agendas and things like that, that there is no honour amongst thieves. That... They can't trust somebody else to be at the top. Every one of them will want to make sure they're high enough up to protect their own backs. And I don't see it's hard for God to cause confusion amongst them. And I'm praying that not that we'll go back, but in going forward, what people are scheming against God, he will turn them in on himself. And where they're trying their very best to get children back under their influence, God will thwart them. Remember the Tower of Babel. He mm -hmm. let them get so far, and then he said, let's go down there and mix up their languages. And out of a global unity, he brought global confusion. So I know Uncle Boris has wanted to get them all back in school. And they might be in for a little while. But I don't think they're going to go back quite the same. And even if they do, the chaos that's been formed, caused in schools, it's going to take them years <clears throat> to sort that's things out. They're not going to do it by the summer even if they have longer hours and things. And I don't, you know, when God s s arises to scatter his enemies, he makes sure the job is finished before he sits down. So I would encourage you to pray for our younger generations that God will not let them go back into the schools of Egypt, schools of godlessness. Mm -hmm. As the church, we failed. We failed 150 years ago, 200 years ago, to protect our young people. We failed in my youth. How many of you here remember a radio program that I listened to in my, during my school days, BBC program called How, Life, How Things Began or How Life Began. Mm. It was about a uncle who took his nephew and his niece on trips back to dinosaur land. Mm. Talked about evolution. And that program was broadcast by BBC and other radio services in every English language country between 1941 and the mid 70s. And there was only one country where the Christians and the church said, we don't want this. And that was New Zealand. Wow. And that's how much we have 
failed to stand up. And, you know, we have failed. We've got to say to God, we have failed to protect the younger generations. It's beyond us now, but it's not beyond God. Yeah. And that is, that is an important factor. So I encourage you. Yeah, they're going to get them back into schools. But I'm not confident that God will let them stop there that long. If I'm wrong, kick me. Mm -hmm. Right? I remember but that. I think God cares for these generations. You've got to remember that the final kingdom is iron and clay, doesn't mix together. And there are other scriptures, as in Zechariah, where they, they turn on each other. The enemy turns and they're already fighting each other mm. on every yeah. single level. Um, it's chaos. And I also think that if you're a teacher, you've got to catch up with the basic subjects, yes. English, science, English and maths and science, mm -hmm. and you won't have time for relationship education, for which I say, alleluia. Thank <laughs> God. It's mandatory. It is now mandatory. Yeah, but I think the point is that they're going to have to focus for at least 18 months. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so they can't do it. <coughs> they will. Some damage has been done, but God can heal and change. Yeah. And, and children are very resistant to things like this. And, you know, they will learn. A child who's motivated to learn will learn. Mm. One of the things is quite often schools text the love of learning and to children. But that's another topic. I'm not going there. Could I just add something from... Just one minute. Okay. Sorry, I just was going to add something from Psalm 45. When we read that, it, it really struck me that, you know, as well as having the... As well as raising our eyes to a, a more positive perspective, we should also be aware of, of Jesus's power where it says, uh, gird your sword upon your thigh, O mighty one, with your glory and majesty, and in your majesty ride prosperously because of truth, humility, and righteousness. And then a bit further down it says, your arrows are sharp in the heart of the king's enemies. And it just makes me think about that we should be praying for bigger things and believing more in God's power. Mm. To, you know, because in, in Revelation, where it talks about um, John sees Jesus on a white horse, he who sat on him was called faithful and true, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. It seems to have echoes of that, and often we have a, a rather pedestrian view. Yeah. <laughs> too small, yeah. you know, too small a horizon. Oh, yeah. Just, uh, uh, yes, Peter. Um, it's been very interesting listening uh, tonight. And of course, read and, and thank you all. Um, and reading the Psalms, it's beautiful. They're beautiful to, to, to just read and to absorb and, to, and just to take it in. And, you know, um, what Randall said was saying, you know, we need to pray. Of course, that's what God wants. Mm -hmm. He wants us to pray. Uh, I mean, when this uh, pandemic started, the psalm that everyone was quoting, and uh, certainly around here, mm. was Psalm 91. Mm. You know, he who dwells in the uh, secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. And I will say, Lord, here's my refuge, my fortress, my God, I will trust. And, and it continues on. But, you know, the disciples said to Jesus, well, Lord, teach us how to pray. And Jesus showed them how to start off by glorifying God. And then eventually came to their 
difficulties, problems, daily bread. But it went on to say, thy kingdom come as it is in heaven on earth. And that's all we need to know, because that's what we want. That's our prayer. Just a comment to uh, yeah. about. Yeah. And of course, there's, there's two applications to that, isn't there? If we're praying that his kingship that's it. would come on earth, that's we're praying that we would live under his kingship. That's, yes. <laughs> But then also we're praying for the return of Christ. Absolutely. The consummation of his kingship. Yeah. So it's both. We are wanting to live. You know, when we pray, your will be done on earth. Yes. The first thing we should say is in my life. Yes. <laughs> and then the second thing is when Jesus returns. Yeah. But people need to be saved, don't they? I don't know about people have viewing here today, have relatives, they have friends, they have neighbours. And, um, you know, it is, it is our call to pray for them. Um, yeah. They might be saved at the end of the day. They may not. But, um, yeah, you know, there's work to be done, isn't there? But we can't go round with sour faces, We've, they've got to see, hopefully, Jesus in mm. us, God in us, because we look at the Psalms, we look at the Bible, and hopefully our faces, you know, our, sure. our perspective in life is very positive. You know, for Peter yeah. and I, this year has been amazing really really amazing we don't want to go back to 2019 <laughs> um but you know we have a job to do don't we yeah but we've got to have it we've got to convince other people by the life and we can only do that with god's help obviously be in the right place yeah. we have granddaughters grandchildren um you know, and it's it's wonderful to, you know, we can encourage them. And it, I just thought it's ideologies. What's what's up there? What's out there are ideologies. That's all they are. They're but they're not all they are. But they're fortresses. They're ideologies. But they won't. They won't. You know, they. God has already. You know, God has already ordained that they will fall, but their ideologies, their fortresses, mm -hmm. and with God's help, we can show others, even people we go out every day when it's not raining, we can have a smile on our, a genuine smile on our face, encourage people that we meet on the street who are very courteous around here. And it's just amazing, I think. Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. What Carol was saying about what we're fighting against and being um, ideologies and things brought back to mind a passage I'm so sure you know from 2 Corinthians 10. Yes. And it says this for we walk though we walk in the flesh yes. we do not war according to the flesh yes. for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, carnal yes. but mighty to the pulling down of strongholds yes. casting down arguments yes. and every high thing that exalts <laughs> itself yes. against the knowledge of god Yes. Yeah. Bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ yeah. or of the King, yeah. Yeah. and being ready to punish all disobedience yeah. when your obedience is fulfilled. Yeah. And that just gives us that bigger picture. Really, we often say, mm -hmm. "Just pick up the first bit," but it's to the casting down of arguments yeah. and everything that exalts itself against the knowledge of Christ. Yes. Mm. And we can't do that in the flesh. 
We can't read up and push ourselves out there to do that. We have to walk in the spirit. We have to be inspired Absolutely. and led by God. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Because it's not carnal weapons. No. It's, it's not coming up with a scheme. It's actually being there when God prompts you to speak what he wants to say to people. Yeah. It's God's word, isn't it? Use yeah. God's word. Yeah. And he will remind you of that if you need to, when you need to. Yeah. And verse six says, and we will be ready to punish every act of disobedience once your obedience is complete. Mm -hmm. So obedience, our obedience seems very important. Oh, yeah. To make it effective. We, we've gone on now for an hour and three quarters, so I'm just thinking oh. we ought to be wrapping it up before some of us turn into pumpkins and things oh. like that. <laughs> um, final points before we stop the recording. If you want to chat afterwards, that's fine, but I think we ought to be bringing it to an end. Any final points? <laughs>